Deze meneer Vuur, daar gaan begin. Dit is dit wat ik als, als, als kind is, hier die oors geweest. Dan pluk ik om de schuus, dus ik om die, de stiek om in die zak vol onder. Achter die vier. En dan uh, vat ik op huis onder. Wordt hij nou zo gekapper, tot die huis een gebrek. Het is mooi opgekomen, het is allemaal doof. Hij heeft hij, hij, twee blaartjes in het droog gekomen. Ja, nee, hier nee, 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 dat doet er weer. Nee, ja, ik kan het niet uitkomen. Nee, 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 ik kan het niet The Bern Declaration is an NGO based in Switzerland. We have 20,000 members and we have been founded in 1968. Since then we are working towards more fair and sustainable North-South relations. This means we are working and monitoring Swiss actors like Swiss companies, the Swiss government or the Swiss consumers and putting pressure on them when they are not behaving in a sustainable manner. Since over 10 years, the Bern Declaration works on biopiracy. We monitor the use of genetic resources and traditional knowledge by Swiss stakeholders and doing a lot of research on patent databases to find potential patents on biopiracy. Through this research, we also find the patent of Nestle for Roybush. So it was the Bern Declaration who discovered this patent? Yes. In 2009, Nestle applied for five patent applications of, of the use of, of um, rooibos and honeybush in certain skin-related products, mostly with respect to anti-inflammatory uses. The use of rooibos and, and, and honeybush um, or any other genetic material from a country without the, the permit to do so is considered to be biopiracy. Natural Justice became involved um, as a result of been contacted by the Bern Declaration and they basically um, informed us about it and said it would, it would be useful if an organization such as Natural Justice raised awareness on this um, in South Africa, both with the government but also then uh, with respect to media. And, and now uh, what we've been doing is looking into to what extent Nestle, with the application of these five patents, has actually been in conflict with international law with respect to the Convention on Biological Diversity and with respect to South African law, which is the bioprospecting framework. And in 1992, an agreement, an international agreement called the Convention on Biodiversity was signed in Rio de Janeiro as part of the Earth Summit. And that was the first time when the rights of communities to benefit from their natural resources was recognized internationally. Northern, particularly industrialized countries, have been exploiting these resources from the time of early colonization to their benefit, without giving much back to the countries where these resources originate. So of course most biodiversity, most of the richness of biodiversity is found in developing countries and it's found in areas which are very rich culturally as well, which, um, you know, where there are indigenous peoples with a very rich tradition of traditional knowledge. In the 1980s there was um, some very important scientific and technological developments in the form of biotechnology. And it opened up a whole new era, really, of what's, what's now called bioprospecting, where companies, uh, researchers, go into biologically rich areas and they look for interesting chemical compounds, interesting genes that can be incorporated into products. In parallel to this, there was a large concern that biodiversity was being exploited at a rate that's, that was unsustainable. So, you know, deforestation, habitat degradation were becoming very critical concerns. So, you know, developing countries were saying we, would, we will conserve these resources, but only if we receive adequate benefits for doing so. Um, and only if we can use them sustainably. And thus was born the Convention on Biodiversity, which has three objectives. The first one is conservation. The second is sustainable use of biological resources. 
And the third one is the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the use of genetic resources. There was a growing understanding of the role that indigenous peoples and local communities have played in conservation of biological diversity. And it also said that if the knowledge of these communities, if the knowledge, innovations and practices of, this community, of these communities are used by third parties, be it research or commercial interests, then they must, the consent of these communities must be taken and there must be fair and equitable sharing of benefits with these communities. And hopefully what access and benefit sharing does is to level the playing field or to move towards equity, to say that if you take, you must give back. And through giving back, we create a virtuous cycle. As a man is now a rich guy, and you have a clean beginning of the skillness, and maybe even now for us, as I said, you heard that as a sicker clean deal like in South Africa, and you say that like a deal from Africa, as dark, as sticky, a very clean sticky world, but as kakbar as for your fealty. And that is the innest place where a man is from, in the cray. En dit is zeker ook hoe kom ons zo so verschrikkelijk natuurvriendelijk werkzaam met ons. Ons zorg dat daar waar die veld is staan, mag daar niet oorweiding gedoen worden. Nie. Ons zorg dat daar niet uh, onbeheerde branden gebeuren. Nie. Want dat is ons geschiedenis, dit is ons deel van onze erfenis. As far as a number of indigenous peoples and local communities are concerned, they don't need to be incentivized to conserve their ecosystems because they live in these ecosystems and for a number of these communities, ecosystems are the most reliable uh, uh, service provider. When the culture of a particular community or the way of life of a particular community is integrally tied to the ecosystem itself, one, doesn't, one needs to more protect the rights of these communities rather than incentivize them for conservation. Um, Nestle submitted um, five patent applications and for one of the claims reads the use of a composition comprising um, Aspalathus lineases or an extract thereof for the preparation of a product to treat and or to prevent inflammatory disorders. If Nestle would get a, a, a patent on, on the particular invention or the particular applications they, they filed with the European Patent Office, um, it would mean that any of the invention that they claim is theirs um, in the patent file would, um, would basically be under monopoly right for Nestle for a period of 20 years. No other competitor would be allowed to market a product that falls within the, the, the particular claim of this patent in, in the country in question. In order to get a patent, what you have to do is you have to demonstrate that your product is new, that it is inventive, and that it has industrial applicability. Most of the people who are with rooibos and wapak, they say, it's a yes and oos. So we have to think about it, it's a yes and oos, how can we make the rooibos product? And rooibos product is gezond, and the people, most of them, Het net rooibos die waarmee hulle um, een inkomste of as eindelijk hulle inkomste is op. Ons maak verskillende um, vloeibare producten. Shower gel, shampoo, foam bath, body lotion, body butter, body scrub en hand wash. Dit is een gezondheidsproduct en dit bevat ons antioxidanten en dit die ook vir eksem. Dat was ons voorouders wat begint het met rooibos. Hulle het eindelijk rooibos gebruik om in te bad. En rooibos het eetlis gegee en um, die moeders wat die melk misschien gehad het die, of kan bekostig het om melk te koop vir die kinders het. Die kinders het die rooibos gedrink. En dat is my leven, dat is my kindse leven. Ek is een enkel ouwer. En dat was ons voorouders wat begint het met rooibos. So, so as ons een product en, en ek sal nie lekker voel as iemand kon sê, maar jylle kan nie rooibos maak he. As hulle dit uh, miskien alleen recht op, op die product wil hee, gaan het een baie groot bedreiging wees. Want dan gaan hulle eindelijk die kost uit onze mond uitvat van ons leven van rooibos. We know that since centuries, people in South Africa are using rooibos against inflammation. So, it's nothing new. There should not be a patent on this. The other problem is that the patents show us that Nestle is using genetic resources from South Africa. And they are using these genetic resources without the prior informed consent from the government and without paying any benefit sharing.
The arguments that Nestle was making was what that they were saying that we are very early on in our research and we just have applied for a patent and we will share benefits uh, once we actually have brought the patent has been granted first of all, but also once the product has actually made it to the market and we enter into 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 where we actually make revenues from these particular products. Um, now, what you find in the South African uh, regulations is that um, it, 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 it splits basically the bioprospecting phases into a, a discovery phase and and a commercial phase, and there are certain trigger points by which uh, the commercial phase starts, and 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 one of these trigger points. Uh, trigger points is the application for a patent, and and basically what the regulation says is that is that um, um, at, at the later stage by when you enter the commercial phase, you would have had to already have um, been given a bioprospecting permit by the government. Another argument that Nestle was making is that they were saying that well, why does this even apply to us? We are we are a Swiss company, you know, we're doing research um, abroad. Um, we have access to material outside of South Africa at, at a trade fair in uh, in Europe somewhere. Um, why why do we have to comply with the South African law? But basically, again, what it says in the South African law is that um, the South African indigenous biological resources is not defined as by where you actually access them, in the sense that you have to come to South Africa and take them here, but whether they historically have come from South Africa. Um, and in the case of rooibos and honeybush, they very clearly have come from South Africa. And in this case, they're saying the, the, the law applies. Whether you then can actually take Nestle to court in Switzerland, that's obviously another matter, and that's where the international protocol comes in, in the sense that hopefully in the future with the implementation of the protocol, you can actually then use the Swiss uh, justice system to take Nestle to court in Switzerland. The Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing is a protocol under the Convention on Biodiversity. I mean, what the protocol does, and which, which is perhaps one of its most useful aspects, is that it provides a global standard for countries that haven't gone through the process yet of developing legislation, and it provides a framework for compliance, which is a, which is a huge issue in terms of how you monitor and enforce and track these genetic resources. Fortunately, we participated for six years in South Africa in the protocol. It was a slow process because it was dealing with issues of rights, trade issues, access issues, compliance issues. But we were clear from day one because we already had an idea of what we want. We wanted our national legislation to be respected, first point. Secondly, we wanted to make sure there's proper compliance, uh, there are issues of checkpoints, there are issues of benefit sharing agreements to, because we, need to, we, need, we needed to protect our own rights. We think that the Nagoya Protocol is a step in the right direction. It's a little bit more precise than in the convention what user countries like Switzerland have to do. It's now clear that in Switzerland the government has to make sure that genetic resources used in our country have been accessed in line with the convention and with the law of the provider country. The South African law says that you need to get the prior informed consent of the owner of these genetic resources. But the agreement has to be approved by the government. We spoke to the South African government. Well, they said, well, they didn't even know about this. So they were unaware of, of these patent applications, let alone whether or not Nestle had, uh, had asked uh, for prior informed consent. Now, Nestle, initially, in the media, after this, this report went out, uh, it's dirty business for clean skin, Nestle robots robbery in South Africa. Nestle immediately kind of responded on its website, uh, saying that these were the three claims that they made. Firstly, South African suppliers who provided robots and honeybush to Nestle research facilities, uh, which used it as part of the fundamental research program in bioactive ingredients. So essentially, the blame was kind of put on the exporter, saying that the exporter was supposed to have known and the exporter was supposed to have gotten the permit. And the onus doesn't lie on the company that buys the resource uh, down the value chain. We were not aware that it will actually lead to patents. Um, if we were aware, it would have solved the, the, the current problem. 
On the other hand, it's um, uh, it's also responsibility of the of the external party um, to uh, to understand the law and to um, and, and first to um, to make sure that how they will deal with that material and how they will deal with the with the process of of the knowledge etc that they comply with international law and also not uh, put the South African supplier in a position where uh, he would be outside the framework of the law. Leslie was asked two questions, saying that well, you should have informed Aperflex about the fact that you were going to use it for bioprospect. If Ap Ap there was no way or reasonable way for Aperflex to have known that this is what you're going to do, but it, but at some level, if you also knew that Aperflex was required to get a permit and you still bought the resource for bioprospecting knowing that Aperflex did not have a permit. They do, that's the problem. What usually happens is that like a company like Nestle, they supply or they submit their international or their patent applications to um, either to the national patent offices or they go through an international filing system which is administered by WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization. WIPO decided that these five patent applications uh, failed the three patentability criteria, which basically means that probably most national offices uh, should Nestle have continued to push the application nationally, would probably have dropped um, them as well. And it doesn't really matter whether they got the patent or not, they still were in conflict with the South African law. It's hard to understand why Nestle has not followed the procedures everybody should know. Nestle is a multinational company which should know about the convention and about the laws in South Africa. Even though Nestle, unfortunately, seemed to have not agreed to be part uh, of this particular documentary, they did send a, a particular media statement in which they uh, then uh, committed it themselves that for any uh, future um, similar activities, for example, with respect to Honeybush and, 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 and Roybush, um, that they will do so under the full compliance of the South African um, relevant legislation. So it basically means that it had an influence with respect to how Nestle is going to do this type of business in South Africa and hopefully in other countries in the future. I think Nestle's attitude was that we are willing to cooperate. Now we are in that process because there are legalities around this. We cannot just jump to a situation to say you must pay because you use so and so is knowledge. It's not as easy as that. Therefore you need the both parties to come around the table to discuss the source of the knowledge how was it transferred, how negotiations took place, and then what sort of beneficiary agreement you should strike at the end of the day. Nestle is much more aware now of what has got to be done, and I think in future they will follow the protocols. It's said that Nestle only acts after there has been a public outcry and after there have been some media work done by natural justice in South Africa and by the Berne Declaration in Switzerland. I think this case shows that the work of NGOs like Natural Justice and the Berne Declaration is still needed. Till today there are thousands of cases of biopiracy all over the world. And it's always, or in most cases, an NGO which points out the problem and then which leads to action by the governments and by the companies. We hope that in the future it's much more the governments taking action and looking out for possible biopiracy cases. It's a good case study to, to see how it should be handled. And uh, we, we look forward to see that the end result will be reached uh, between Nestle and the government and ourselves as a supplier of uh, plant material. South Africa is, is incredibly rich with um, uh, medicinal plants or plants in general, indigenous plants with functional value. I don't think we've, we've touched on the, the real uh, value and the potential. I feel today, and for this time, feel so trots that the life is so unwelcome. When I was in my kinder day, in young day, I was slave, when another man was, and today, as I live here, I'm back, I'm my own slave.